So Bat Shalom. Today's uh, sermon, uh, I'm shooting from the house and not from the shul. And those of you who are uh, still listening on our conference call, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, please mute yourself out by pressing star six so that it will not interrupt uh, the video sermon. Today's Parsha is Vayachel Pepe Day. Uh, the sermon is called Contrasts of Faith. This week's Parsha describes the building and the completion of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. We can see in Exodus 39, verses 42 to 43, it says, Just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so the Israelites had done all the work, and when Moses saw that they had performed all the tasks as the Lord had commanded, so they had done. Moses blessed them. Two ideas stand out here. First, the Israelites did all the work. And not only did they provide all the materials for the tabernacle in a massive free will offering, but they provided the labor, the skill, the sweat necessary uh, to create this elaborate structure within the space of less than a year, Exodus 39, verse 42, and 40, verse 17. And secondly, they did it all exactly as God had commanded. Now today, in the extremely challenging days that we are in right now, <clears throat> and with many people sheltered in their homes, I am reminded of a few key scriptures I feel may give us hope and enrich our faith during these dangerous days. First, let's start with Psalm 91, verses 1 through 11. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of El Yun will abide in the shadow of Shaddai. I will say of Adonai, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will rescue you from the hunter's trap and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is body armor and shield. You will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the scourge that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the wicked paid back. For you have made Elyon your dwelling, even Adonai, who is my refuge. So no evil will befall you, nor any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. That was from Psalm 91, verses 1 to 11. Please read it again when you find the chance. The other scripture that I'm sharing today, and actually most of today's message is based upon, is found in Isaiah 26, verses 1 through 21. But today, I'm going to be sharing just this one verse from Isaiah the prophet, chapter 26, verse 20. It says, Go, my people, enter your rooms, and shut your doors behind you. Hide for a little while, until the wrath is past. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> if you were to take out a United States coin or bill, <clears throat> you would find somewhere on that coin or bill the phrase, in God we trust. And this motto was adopted by Congress during the Civil War and has been confirmed by acts of Congress and by various courts. 
In recent times, various groups have been challenging that motto as being a violation of separation of church and state. To date, such efforts have been fruitless. They have been, there have been some interesting suggestions as to what we should change our motto to, and let me share one of them with you. One of them that was suggested, instead of God we trust, should be, Peace be the journey. And the writer gives this reason for adopting that particular phrase. <clears throat> Quote, what this country needs is peace. Uh, what this country needs is peace. And in God we trust, a motto which supports religion, something that proliferates war and hostility both domestically and internationally, is far from the want of peace. <clears throat> Her reasoning obviously shows her lack of understanding of what all people really want, namely peace. In fact, one of the titles of Messiah found in Isaiah chapter 9 is Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. The basic reason people want to change the national motto is our current national motto has never represented all the citizens of the United States. And I would agree with that statement. To say that everyone in the United States has trusted exclusively in God or that the United States government has trusted exclusively in God is absurd. God is not nearly as concerned about whether we say that we trust in God as much as whether we actually trust in God. You know, we keep returning to this issue of trust. And trust is a word uh, translated from Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word often emunah is translated as trust, but it's also translated more times as faith. So emunah is faith, but it can also mean trust. And we keep returning to the issue of emunah, of trust, of faith, because the whole first half of Isaiah has this basic underlying theme of emunah, of trust, of faith. And today's message is entitled Contrasts in Faith. <clears throat> you see, the Israelites during Isaiah's time claimed that they trusted in God. And to a certain degree they did, but they also trusted in other gods, some of them. They trusted God, but they also trusted in Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, and other nations for their protection. Some of them trusted in Baal and other gods. And while the names and context is different, we see the issues are the same for the United States in the 21st century as they were for Judah in the 8th century BCE. Here in Isaiah chapter 26, the prophet gives us four contrasts between those who trust in God and those who do not. One, inhabit inhabiting the divine city or lofty ruins. Two, walking the divine path or the aimless way. Three, working with divine ability or human ability. And four, risk, uh, uh, rising to life eternal or rising to judgment. Now let's talk about inhabiting the divine city or lofty ruins, which is verses 1 through 6 of Isaiah 26. In verses 1 through 6, we see this contrast between inhabiting a divine city or inhabiting lofty ruins. Isaiah tells us that those who trust in God will live in a strong city. And we have the same call today. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us to look for a city whose architect and builder is God. That's Hebrews 11 verse 10. To look for a city whose architect and builder is God. And John describes this city in Revelation 21. We won't read that today, but I encourage you to take a look at it. And what does Isaiah say about that city? First, he tells us that the city is strong and that salvation is in its walls and ramparts. Our salvation is our protection, but also our separation, which is what Holy means, holy comes from the Hebrew word kadosh, meaning separate, apart, other than.
there is a clear distinction here. Those who are saved are inside the city with God and protected by God. And those who are not saved are outside the city. So how does one get inside the city? Well, there is a gate. And we know Messiah, we know that he is the gate. In John 10, verses 9 and 10, it says this, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. We can't enter by climbing over the wall, by trying to save ourselves through works of righteousness. And we can't enter by digging under the wall, by trying to get around God's righteousness and salvation. I'm reminded here, I uh, recently saw a video on the news of a, uh, of a uh, for the sake of argument, let's call him either a desperate person or a criminal, we don't know which. He has gloves on and a mask on, and he approaches a turnstile at the subway. He first sprays everything with disinfectant before he puts his hands on two turnstile tops so that he can jump over the turnstile. So he wants to make sure it's clean before he commits the crime of not paying his way. We cannot climb over the wall to the city of God. We have to enter through the gate. And just as there would be one way to enter a fortified city through the gate, so there is only one way to enter God's salvation through the gate that he provided. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua the Messiah. We don't enter because of righteous works. We enter by faith. This righteous nation is righteous because they trust in God. I'm talking about Israel in the days of Messiah, those who were able to enter that city in this prophetic explanation by, or this prophecy through Isaiah. They're righteous only because they trust in God, not because of anything they have done. They're righteous because such trust is steadfast. It's a constant. They're righteous because their trust is in Adonai forever. And we are declared righteous when we trust in God, not because we carry around coins or bills that say, in God we trust. I remember there was an old expression. Uh, People would say, well, how can I, uh, you know, cover this? What kind of payment Uh, when they were buying something? And uh, a a humorous expression, this goes back to the 70s at least, was, uh, you know, uh, in God we trust all others pay cash. You see, Isaiah contrasts the city of God with the city of man. If you look at it and you understand it, this is what we're finding. We find in Isaiah chapter 26, the prophet is contrasts of faith here, contrasting one of these things is the city of God and the city of man. Trust in God allows us to inhabit the city of God, a city of faith and hope. Trust in man allows us to inhabit a lofty city, but it's a city doomed to destruction. The city of man looks secure. Well, with the naked eye, yeah, it looks great, looks secure. It's lofty, it's well established, but looks are deceiving. That city will be demolished. That city will be destroyed. The city will be ground into dust and trampled by those who were formerly excluded. Trust in anything but God is trust misplaced because this world and all its values and all its systems will be destroyed. It must come to an end. Which city do you spend your time in? Are you living in the city of God or the city of man? Are you trying to live in both cities? 
Are you maintaining summer and winter homes in two different cities? You need to make a choice. We all need to make a choice. If not now, when? While we do business in the city of man, we are to live in the city of God. As we're taught in the new covenant, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Walking in the divine path or the aimless way. This is the second of Isaiah's four contrasts of faith. Walking in the divine path or the aimless way. Isaiah 26 illustrates this issue of trust, of emunah, of faith in another way. Walking down a road, verses 7 through 11. Isaiah tells us that the divine path, God's path, is level and straight. It's level and straight. And that if you look in verse 7, Isaiah tells us that the path of the righteous is level. Then he calls God, O upright one. It's essentially the same Hebrew root. The idea here is that God's path is level because God is level. He never changes. He's always the same. God's path is straight because God is straight. God's path is righteous because God is righteous. We walk in God's path by imitating the character of God. Isaiah is not saying that God's path here, he's not saying that God's path is a stroll in the park. But he is saying that the path is easy to find. And all God is asking us to do is to imitate him. Every single command God has given is a reflection of some aspect of his divine character. Imitating God may not be easy, but the requirements are clear. And by contrast, the way of the world is aimless and clueless. Isaiah gives us three pictures of how people refuse to follow God. In verse 10, Even though people of the world are shown grace, they do not learn. God shows his grace by withholding punishment for sin and by declaring his good news. But they do not learn to be right with God. If we look at verse 10b of Isaiah 26, we see that the people, you know, they live in an upright land, but they go on doing evil. And even when God provides stable governments and everything is plain sailing, smooth sailing, they refuse to acknowledge God as the king. Verse 11, even if God's hand is lifted high for everybody to see, even if he performs miracles that are undeniably miracles, they refuse to see it, they refuse to acknowledge it. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And people, they know the righteous acts of God. They can see the divine path, but they willfully refuse to walk in it, and they encourage others not to walk in it either. They choose to walk the aimless way, a way with no destination. Are you choosing to walk the divine path? or the aimless way. Working with divine ability or human ability, this is the third contrast that Isaiah gives in this chapter 26 of this revelation. Working with divine ability or human ability. Isaiah uh, chapter 26, verses 12 through 18. Everything that we have accomplished has been done by God working through us. That was true in Isaiah. That is true in our congregation. It is true for each of us. Kehilat Hadera, Congregation of the Way, the Messianic Congregation, isn't there because the founders established it and incorporated it. God established this Kehilat. God used people to start this congregation by working through them, by gifting them with talents and abilities, as we see there In the end uh, chapters of Exodus, how God uh, is using people that he has given certain giftings and talents to. But it was God himself who established our congregation. 
If we look at the uh, ethics of the fathers, the Perkei Avot, Jewish writings, it says this. It says, any assembly dedicated for the sake of heaven shall endure. Any assembly dedicated for the sake of heaven shall endure. If this congregation continues, it is because God will continue to do his work through us. And for that reason only, God's name is honored. We are established, we continue, and we will grow only by his name and by his power. Are we, as a synagogue in the 21st century, working in our own power, or are we relying on God's power? By contrast, Isaiah tells us what happens when we work in our own human power, our own human ability, verses 17 through 18. Isaiah uses the imagery here of a woman giving birth. Anyone who has had a child any, uh, knows that giving birth takes an enormous effort. Nine months, the child is growing inside the womb. Then the day arrives and suddenly there's tremendous agony. This image of a woman struggling to give birth is the strongest image Isaiah could invoke here to explain. But nothing comes of all that labor. Imagine after going through labor, the doctor tells you that you didn't give birth to a baby, it was just gas, some kind of other pain. That's what Isaiah is trying to get across here. When we work in our own strength, we achieve nothing at all. Even if we were to work as hard as a woman giving birth, our work accomplishes nothing. Are we as a shul working in God's divine ability, in his power, or in our own human ability, our own human power? Which is it? This last contrast Isaiah draws is between the eternal destination of the righteous and the wicked, verses 19 through 21. God's people will rise to eternal life amid shouts of joy to share in the festivities of God's final triumph. The wicked will rise to eternal punishment. Now, the previous three contrasts, inhabiting the city of God versus lofty ruins, walking the divine path versus wandering in the aimless way, and working in God's strength versus working in our own inabilities, are all choices that we make. This last contrast is the result of those choices. I'm reminded of a, of a children's poem, and it goes like this. Some of you may have heard it, or possibly in a song. One door and only one, yet the sides are two. Inside and outside, which side are you? One way and only one, yet the ways are two. Right way and wrong way, which way are you? Eternal life with God or eternal separation from God, which result will be yours? All this prepares us for the glorious conclusion of the book of Exodus. As you heard, if you were on the prayer call during the Torah reading from Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38, it ends this way. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter it, uh, enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And whenever the cloud was taken up from above the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up for the cloud. <clears throat> The cloud of Adonai was above the Mishkan, the tabernacle, by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. You see, the glory of God, this cloud of glory, appears again later in Solomon's temple, hundreds of years later. But then it's absent for hundreds of years. And the glory cloud reappears in the days of Yeshua, in the days of Messiah. If we look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, you're going to see this happening. You see, Moses took his disciple Joshua with him 
when he goes up on Mount Sinai. And here in Matthew 17, Yeshua takes his chosen disciples to a high mountain to pray. Traditionally, some say this is Mount Tabor in Israel. Uh, but on this other mountain, Yeshua is transformed. And it says in Matthew 17, verse 2, and his face shone like the sun. Moses is there with Elijah the prophet, and they appeared and they spoke with him. And Yeshua's disciple Peter, seeing this, suggested that the disciples should build not just one uh, shack or hut, but three of them to mark this divine event. Three tents. Perhaps Peter had in mind the portable tent, the portable tabernacle, the Mishkan in the wilderness. Because like at Sinai, this, this cloud of glory of God is something that is shaking uh, the people when Moses comes down with this glory of God on his face. Uh, he was shining like the sun. And now Yeshua's face is shining like the sun. And it is awe-inspiring. The people want to keep their distance, which reminds me of today. We're being taught social distance because of this, because of this uh, virus out there, social distance. But also... When Moses would come, came down from the mountain and his face was shining like the sun, people were keeping their distance. Here, in Matthew 17, Moses is up on this, uh, sorry, Yeshua is up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. His face is shining like the sun. His whole body is shining brilliantly, blinding white. And Peter looks up and he sees Moses and Elijah standing with Yeshua. And Peter keeps at his distance. Then Yeshua drew near and he touched him and he said, Arise and do not be afraid. So remember that our Father is with you through whatever you're going through, whatever I'm going through, whatever we're all going through right now in these difficult, dangerous days. The Father is with you. The Ruach, the Spirit is with you. Yeshua is with you. What did God say to Kepha, say to Peter that day on that mountain? He said this, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And what does Yeshua say? He says, Arise and do not be Afraid. Remember that God was a shield to Abraham. He was a shield to David. And through Yeshua, the Messiah, and the Spirit of Holiness, He will be a shield to you and your family. He is your rock. He is your refuge. No plague will come near your tent. Psalm 91. Trust in Him. Have emunah. Have faith in Him. And do not let your faith be contrasted by the world. You are walking a path. You are living a path which is holy and righteous to the best of your ability. Spend more time in prayer. And join me in this week in giving certain things up. More time in prayer. More uh, perhaps giving things up. Maybe your favorite thing in the world is fig newton cookies. And if fig newton cookies are your favorite thing, then fast for three days. Give up the Fig Newton cookies. Eat only what you need to to survive. Fast. Pray. Anoint one another with oil if you have it. Get on your knees and pray to the living God that the angel of death would not come near you or your loved ones. Mark your doorpost with the blood of Messiah. For he is with you, and he shed his blood so that you would not die, but have eternal life. That is my message for today. Contrasts of hope. Shabbat shalom. God bless.